Section four of Victorian short stories Tales of Courtship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Victorian short stories Tales of Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe et al. Anthony Garstin's Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe. Savoy, July, 1896. Section 1. A stampede of huddled sheep, wildly scampering over the slaty shingle, emerged from the leaden mist that muffled the fell-top, and a shrill shepherd's whistle broke the damp stillness of the air, and presently a man's figure appeared, following the sheep down the hillside. He halted a moment to whistle curtly to his two dogs, who, laying back their ears, chased the sheep at top speed beyond the brow then his hands deep in his pockets he strode vigorously forward a streak of white smoke from the toiling train was creeping silently across the distance the great grey desolate undulations of treeless country showed no other sign of life the sheep hurried in single file along a tiny track worn threadbare amid the brown lumpy grass and as the man came round the mountain's shoulder a narrow valley opened out beneath him a scanty patchwork of green fields and here and there a whitewashed farm flanked by a dark cluster of sheltering trees the man walked with a loose swinging gait his figure was spare and angular he wore a battered black felt hat and clumsy iron-bound boots his clothes were dingy from long exposure to the weather he had close-set insignificant eyes much wrinkled and stubbly eyebrows streaked with grey his mouth was close shaven and drawn by his abstraction into hard and taciturn lines beneath his chin bristled an unkempt fringe of sandy coloured hair when he reached the foot of the fell the twilight was already blurring the distance the sheep scurried with a noisy rustling across a flat swampy stretch overgrown with rushes while the dogs headed them towards a gap in a low ragged wall built of loosely heaped boulders the man swung the gate too after them and waited whistling peremptorily recalling the dogs a moment later the animals reappeared cringing as they crawled through the bars of the gate he kicked out at them contemptuously and mounting a stone stile a few yards further up the road dropped into a narrow lane presently as he passed a row of lighted windows he heard a voice call to him he stopped and perceived a crooked white-bearded figure wearing clerical clothes standing in the garden gateway good evening antony a raw evening this ay mr blencarn tis a bit frittish he answered i've just been getting a few lambs off to fell i hope you're keating fairly and miss rosa too he spoke briefly with a loud spontaneous cordiality thank ye antony thank ye rosa's down at the church playing over the hymns for to-morrow how's mrs garstin nicely thank ye mr blencarn she's wonderful active his mother well good night to you antony said the old man clicking the gate good night mr blencarn he called back a few minutes later the twinkling lights of the village came in sight and from within the sombre form of the square towered church looming by the roadside the slow solemn strains of the organ floated out on the evening air antony lightened his tread then paused listening but presently becoming aware that a man stood listening also on the bridge some few yards distant he moved forward again slackening his pace as he approached he eyed the figure keenly but the man paid no heed to him remaining with his back turned gazing over the parapet into the dark gurgling stream antony trudged along the empty village street past the gleaming squares of ruddy gold starting on either side out of the darkness now and then he looked furtively backwards the straight open road lay behind him glimmering wanly the organ seemed to have ceased the figure on the bridge had left the parapet and appeared to be moving away towards the church antony halted watching it till it had disappeared into the blackness beneath the churchyard trees then after a moment's hesitation he left the road and mounted an upland meadow towards his mother's farm 
it was a bare oblong house in front a whitewashed porch and a narrow garden plot enclosed by a low iron railing were dimly discernible behind the steep fellside loomed like a monstrous mysterious curtain hung across the night he passed round the back into the twilight of a wide yard cobbled and partially grass-grown vaguely flanked by the shadowy outlines of long low farm buildings all was wrapped in darkness somewhere overhead a bat fluttered darting its puny scream inside a blazing peat fire scattered capering shadows across the smooth stone floor flickered among the dim shadows of ham suspended from the ceiling and on the panelled cupboards of dark glistening oak a servant girl spreading the cloth for supper clattered her clogs in and out of the kitchen old mrs garstin was stooping before the hearth tremulously turning some girdle cakes that lay roasting in the embers at the sound of antony's heavy tread in the passage she rose glancing sharply at the rock above the chimney-piece she was a heavy-built woman upright stalwart almost despite her years her face was gaunt and sallow deep wrinkles accentuated the hardness of her features she wore a black widow's cap above her iron-grey hair gold-rimmed spectacles and a soiled checkered apron you're very late tony she remarked querulously he unloosened his woollen neckerchief and when he had hung it methodically with his hat behind the door answered twas terrible thick on to fell top and them two bitches be that senseless she caught his sleeve and through her spectacles suspiciously scrutinized his face you didna meet wi rosa blencarn nay she was in church in plain wi loot stock hangin round the door he retorted bitterly rebuffing her with rough impatience she moved away nodding sententiously to herself they began supper neither spoke antony sat slowly stirring his tea and staring moodily into the flames the bacon on his plate lay untouched from time to time his mother laying down her knife and fork looked across at him in unconcealed asperity pursing her wide ungainly mouth at last abruptly setting down her cup she broke out i wonder you have na ma pride tony for who long are you going to continue setting moping and brooding like a sex sheep you just make yourself ill and then i reckon that you'll prove satisfied ay but i wonder you have na more pride but he made no answer remaining unmoved as if he had not heard presently half to himself without raising his eyes he murmured luke be going south monday well you canna take up wi his leaving anyways it has na come to that has it you don't intend setting old parish a laughing at you a second occasion he flushed dully and bending over his plate mechanically began his supper well dang it he broke out a minute later d'ye think i heed the cackling of fifty parishes na nah, not i and with a short grim laugh he brought his fist down heavily on the oak table you're daft tony the old woman blurted daft and na daft i tell you this mother that i be forty-six year o age this back end and there be some things i will na listen to rosa blencarn's bonny enough for me ay bonny enough and a patience wi ye bonny enough trick tootin of furbelows and gallivantin wi every roist prepareth bonny enough that be all ye think on she's been a proper parson's niece the giddy feckless creature and, and she'd make ye a proper sort of wife tony garstin ye great fond booby she put back in her chair and hurriedly clattering the crockery began to clear away the supper toos be mind lord be prayed she continued in a loud hard voice and as long as he spare me tony i'll na see rosy blencarn set foot inside it antony scowled without replying and drew his chair to the hearth his mother bustled about the room behind him after a while she asked did ye pen clams in back field na they're in allen bottom he answered curtly the door closed behind her and by and by he could hear her moving overhead meditatively blinking he filled his pipe clumsily and pulling a crumpled newspaper from his pocket sat on over the smouldering fire reading and stolidly puffing 
Section 2 The music rolled through the dark, empty church. The last leaden flicker of daylight glimmered in through the pointed windows and beyond the level rows of dusky pews, tenanted only by a litter of prayer books. Two guttering candles revealed the organ pipes and the young girl's swaying figure. She played vigorously. Once or twice the tune stumbled and she recovered it impatiently, bending over the keyboard, showily flourishing her wrists as she touched the stops. She was bareheaded. Her hat and cloak lay beside her on a stool. She had fair, fluffy hair, cut short behind her neck, large, round eyes, heightened by a fringe of dark lashes, rough, ruddy cheeks, and a rosy, full-lipped, unstable mouth. She was dressed quite simply, in a black, close-fitting bodice, a little frayed at the sleeves. Her hands and neck were coarsely fashioned. Her comeliness was brawny, literal, unfinished, as it were. When at last the ponderous chords of the Amen faded slowly into the twilight, flushed, breathing a little quickly, she paused, listening to the stillness of the church. Presently a small boy emerged from behind the organ. "'Good evening, Miss Rosa,' he called, trotting briskly away down the aisle. "'Good night, Robert,' she answered absently. After a while, with an impatient gesture, as if to shake some importunate thought from her mind, she rose abruptly, pinned on her hat, threw her cloak round her shoulders, blew out the candles, and groped her way through the church, towards the half-open door. As she hurried along the narrow pathway that led across the churchyard, of a sudden a figure started out of the blackness. "'Who's that?' she cried in a loud, frightened voice. A man's uneasy laugh answered her. "'It's only me, Rosa. I didn't think to scare you. I've been waiting for you this hour past.' She made no reply, but quickened her pace. He strode on beside her. "'I'm off Monday, you know,' he continued, and, as she said nothing, "'Will you not stop just a minute? I'd like to speak a few words with you before I go, and tomorrow I have to get over to Scarsdale betimes,' he persisted. "'I don't want to speak with you. I don't want ever to see you again. I just hate the sight of you.' She spoke with a vehement, concentrated hoarseness. "'Nay, but you must listen to me. I will not be put off with fretching speeches.' And gripping her arm, he forced her to stop. "'Loose me, you great beast!' she broke out. "'And I hold you if you just stand quiet-like. "'I meant to speak fair to you, Rosa.' They stood at a bend in the road, face to face, quite close together. Behind his burly form stretched the dimness of a grey, ghostly field. "'What's it you have to say to me? "'Have done with it quick,' she said sullenly. "'It'll be just this, Rosa,' he began with dogged gravity. "'I want to tell you that if any trouble comes to you after I'm gone, you know to what I refer. I want to tell you that I'm prepared to act square by you. I've written out on an envelope me address in London. Luke Stock, care of Purcell and Company, Smithfield Market, London. You're a bad, sinful man. I just hate sight of you. I wish you were dead. Aye, but I reckon what you'd have best thought of that before. You changed your whistle considerably since Tuesday. "'Now, hold on,' he added, as she struggled to push past him. "'Here's the envelope.' She snatched the paper and tore it passionately, scattering the fragments on the road. When she had finished, he burst out angrily. "'You cussed unreasonable fool!' "'Let me pass, if you've not more to say,' she cried. "'Nay, I'll not part with you in this fashion. You can speak soft enough when you choose.' And seizing her shoulders— he forced her backwards against the wall. "'You do look fine and no mistake when you're just ablaze with raging,' he laughed bluntly, lowering his face to hers. "'Loose me! Loose me, you great coward!' she gasped, striving to free her arms. Holding her fast, he expostulated, "'Come, Rosa, can we not part friends?' "'Part friends, indeed!' she retorted bitterly. "'Friends with a like of you. What do you take me for? Let me get home, I tell you, and please God I'll never set eyes on you again. I hate sight of you.' "'Be off with you, then,' he answered, pushing her roughly back into the road. "'Be off with you, you silly. You canna say I have no spec fair to you, and by goom 
you'll na see me shally wallyin' in this fashion again be off wi ye ye can just shift for yourself since ye canna keep a civil tongue in your head the girl catching her breath stood as if dazed watching his retreating figure then starting forward at a run disappeared up the hill into the darkness section three old mr blencarn concluded his husky sermon the scanty congregation who had been sitting stolidly immobile in their stiff sunday clothes shuffled to their feet and the pew full of school children in clamorous chorus intoned the final hymn Antony stood near the organ absently contemplating while the rude melody resounded through the church rosa's deft manipulation of the keyboard the rugged lines of his face were relaxed to a vacant thoughtful limpness that aged his expression not a little now and then as if for reference he glanced questioningly at the girl's profile a few minutes later the service was over and the congregation sauntered out down the aisle a gawky group of men remained loitering by the church door one of them called to antony but nodding curtly he passed on and strode away down the road across the grey upland meadows towards home as soon as he breasted the hill however and was no longer visible from below he turned abruptly to the left along a small swampy hollow till he had reached the lane that led down from the fell side he clambered over a rugged moss-grown wall and stood gazing expectantly down the dark disused roadway then after a moment's hesitation perceiving nobody seated himself beneath the wall on a projecting slab of stone overhead hung a sombre drifting sky a gusty wind rollicked down from the fell huge masses of chilly grey stripped from the last night's mist a few dead leaves fluttered over the stones and from off the fell side there floated the plaintive quavering rumour of many bleating sheep before long he caught sight of two figures coming towards him slowly climbing the hill he sat awaiting their approach fidgeting with his sandy beard and abstractly grinding the ground beneath his feet at the brow they halted plunging his hands deep into his pockets he strolled sheepishly towards them ah good day to you antony called the old man in a shrill breathless voice tis a long hill and my legs are not what they were time was when i'd think naught of a whole day's tramp on twirls i am getting feeble antony that's what tis and if rosa here wasn't the great strong lass she is i don't know how her old uncle would manage and he turned to the girl with a proud tremulous smile will you take my arm a bit mr blencarn miss rosa'll be tired likely antony asked nay mr garstin but i can manage nicely the girl interrupted sharply antony looked up at her as she spoke she wore a straw hat trimmed with crimson velvet and a black fur-edged cape that seemed to set off mightily the fine whiteness of her neck her large dark eyes were fixed upon him he shifted his feet uneasily and dropped his glance she linked her uncle's arm in hers and the three moved slowly forward old mr blencarn walked with difficulty pausing at intervals for breath antony his eyes bent on the ground sauntered beside him clumsily kicking at the cobbles that lay in his path when they reached the vicarage gate the old man asked him to come inside not just now thank you mr blencarn i've that lot of lambs to see to before dinner it's a grand man in this he added inconsequently uncle's bought a nice lot of leghorns tuesday rosa remarked antony met her gaze there was a grave subdued expression on her face this morning that made her look more of a woman less of a girl ay do you show him the birds rosa i'll be glad to have his opinion on em the old man turned to hobble into the house and rosa as she supported his arm called back over her shoulder i'll not be a minute mr garstin antony strolled round to the yard behind the house and waited watching a flock of glossy white poultry that strutted perkily pecking over the grass-grown cobbles ay miss rosa they're a bonny lot he remarked as the girl joined him are they not she rejoined scattering a handful of corn before her the birds scuttled across the yard with greedy outstretched necks the two stood side by side gazing at them 
"'What did he give for em? Anthony asked. Fifty-five shillings. Aye, he assented, nodding absently. "'Was Dr. Sanderson a seeing o' your father yesterday?' he asked, after a moment. "'He came in forenoon. He said he was just no worse.' "'You know, Miss Rosa, as I'm still thinking on ye,' he began abruptly, without looking up. "'I reckon it ain't much use,' she answered shortly, scattering another handful of corn towards the birds. "'I reckon I'll never marry. I'm just weary of being courted.' "'I wouldn't a weary ye with courting,' he interrupted. She laughed noisily. "'You are a queer customer, and no mistake.' "'I'm a match for Luch stock, anyway,' he continued fiercely. "'You think now to take in oop with him? "'About as ranty, wild a young feller as ever stepped.' The girl reddened and bit her lip. "'I don't know what you mean, Mr. Garstin. "'It seems to me you're might hasty in jumping to conclusions.' "'Maybe I can see a thing or two. he retorted doggedly. "'Luke Stock's gone to London, anyway. "'Aye, and a powerful good job, too, in t opinion of some folks.' "'You're just jealous,' she exclaimed with a forced titter. "'You're just jealous o' Luke Stock.' "'Nay, but you needn't a fill your head with that nonsense. "'I'm too set on you to feel jealousy,' he answered gravely. "'The smile faded from her face, and she murmured, "'I canna make ye out, Mr. Garston.' "'Nay, that ye canna. "'And I suppose it's natural, considering ye're little more than a child, "'and I'm almost old enough to be your father.' he retorted with blunt bitterness. "'But you know your mother's took that dislike to me. She'd never abide the sight of me at Toosie. He remained silent a moment, moodily reflecting. she just had to get o'er it, as he not in that objection,' he declared. "'Nay, Mr. Garstin, it canna be. Indeed, it canna be at all. You'd best just put it right from your mind, once and for all.' "'I'd just best put it off my mind, had I? "'You talk like a child,' he burst out scornfully. "'I intend you to come to love me, and I will na take you till you do. "'I'll just go on waiting for you, and mark my words. "'My day'll come at last.' "'He spoke loudly, in a slow, stubborn voice, and stepped suddenly towards her. "'With a faint, frightened cry, she shrank back into the doorway of the hen-house.' "'You talk like a prophet. You sort of scare me.' He laughed grimly and paused, reflectively scanning her. He seemed about to continue in the same strain, but instead turned abruptly on his heel and strode away through the garden gate. Section 4 For three hundred years there had been a Garstin at Hootsey. Generation after generation had tramped the grey stretch of upland, in the springtime scattering their flocks over the fell sides and at the back end on dark winter afternoons driving them home again down the broad bridle path that led over the rays they had been a race of few words keeping themselves to themselves as the phrase goes beholden to no man filled with a dogged churlish pride an upright old-fashioned race stubborn long-lived rude in speech slow of resolve Antony had never seen his father, who had died one night upon the fell-top, he and his shepherd engulfed in the great snowstorm of 1849. Folks had said that he was the only Garstin who had failed to make old man's bones. After his death, Jake Atkinson, from Ribblehead in Yorkshire, had come to live at Hootsey. Jake was a fine farmer, a canny bargainer, and very handy among the sheep, till he took to drink and roistering every week with the town wenches up at carlisle he was a corpulent deep-voiced free-handed fellow when his time came though he died very hardly he remained festive and convivial to the last and for years afterwards in the valley his memory lingered men spoke of him regretfully recalling his quips his feats of strength and his choice breed of herdwick rams but he left behind him a host of debts up at Carlisle, in Penrith, and in almost every market town, debts that he had long ago pretended to have paid with money that belonged to his sister. The widow Garstin sold the twelve Herdwick rams and nine acres of land. Within six weeks she had cleared off every penny, and for thirteen months on Sundays wore her mourning 
with a mute forbidding grimness the bitter thought that unbeknown to her jake had acted dishonestly in money matters and that he had ended his days in riotous sin soured her pride imbued her with a rancorous hostility against all the world for she was a very proud woman independent holding her head high so folks said like a gasting bred and born and antony although some reckoned him quiet and of little account came to take after her as he grew into manhood she took into her own hands the management of the hootsey farm and set the boy to work for her along with the two farm servants it was twenty-five years now since his uncle jake's death there were grey hairs in his sandy beard but he still worked for his mother as he had done when a growing lad and now that times were grown to be bad of late years the price of stock had been steadily falling and the hay harvests had drifted from bad to worse the widow garstin no longer kept any labouring men but lived she and her son year in and year out in a close parsimonious way that had been antony garstin's life a dull eventless sort of business the sluggish incrustation of monotonous years and until rosa blencarn had come to keep house for her uncle he had never thought twice on a woman's face the garstins had always been good churchgoers and antony for years had acted as churchwarden it was one summer evening up at the vicarage whilst he was checking the offertory account that he first set eyes upon her she was fresh back from school at leeds she was dressed in a white dress she looked he thought like a london lady she stood by the window tall and straight and queenly dreamily gazing out into the summer twilight whilst he and her uncle sat over their business when he rose to go she glanced at him with quick curiosity he hurried away muttering a sheepish good night the next time that he saw her was in church on sunday he watched her shyly with a hesitating reverential discretion her beauty seemed to him wonderful distant enigmatic in the afternoon young mrs forsyth from longscale dropped in for a cup of tea with his mother and the two set off gossiping of rosa blencarn speaking of her freely in tones of acrimonious contempt for a long while he sat silent puffing at his pipe but at last when his mother concluded with she looks to me fair stuck up full of toonish airs and graces despite himself he burst out you're just wasting your breath with that cackle i reckon miss blencarn's a different clay to us folks young mrs forsyth tittered immoderately and the next week it was rumoured about the valley that tony garstin was gone loony over to parson's niece but of all this he knew nothing keeping to himself as was his wont and being besides very busy with the hay harvest until one day at dinner-time henry sisson asked if he'd started his courting jacob sowerby cried that tony'd been too slow in getting to work for that the girl had been seen spooning in crosby shores with kerbison the auctioneer and the others there were half a dozen of them lounging round the hay wagon burst into a boisterous guffaw antony flushed dully looking hesitatingly from one to the other then slowly put down his beer can and of a sudden seizing jacob by the neck swung him heavily on the grass he fell against the wagon wheel and when he rose the blood was streaming from an ugly cut in his forehead and henceforward tony garstin's courtship was the common jest of all the parish as yet however he had scarcely spoken to her though twice he had passed her in the lane that led up to the vicarage she had given him a frank friendly smile but he had not found the resolution to do more than lift his hat he and henry sisson stacked the hay in the yard behind the house there was no further mention made of rosa blencarn but all day long antony as he knelt thatching the rick brooded over the strange sweetness of her face and on the fell top while he tramped after the ewes over the dry crackling heather and as he jogged along the narrow rickety road driving his cartload of lambs into the auction mart thus as the week slipped by he was content with blunt wistful ruminations upon her indistinct image jacob sowerby's accusation and several kindred innuendos let fall by his mother 
left him coolly incredulous the girl still seemed to him altogether distant but from the first sight of her face he had evolved a stolid unfaltering conception of her difference from the ruck of her sex but one evening as he passed the vicarage on his way down from the fells she called to him and with a childish confiding familiarity asked for advice concerning the feeding of the poultry in his eagerness to answer her as best he could he forgot his customary embarrassment and grew for the moment almost voluble and quite at his ease in her presence directly her flow of questions ceased however the returning perception of her rosy hesitating smile and of her large deep eyes looking straight into his face perturbed him strangely and reddening he remembered the quarrel in the hayfield and the tale of crosby shaws after this the poultry became a link between them a link which he regarded in all seriousness blindly unconscious that there was aught else to bring them together only feeling himself in awe of her because of her schooling her townish manners her ladylike mode of dress and soon he came to take a sturdy secret pride in her friendly familiarity towards him several times a week he would meet her in the lane and they would loiter a moment together she would admire his dogs though he assured her earnestly that they were but sorry curs and once laughing at his staidness she nicknamed him mr churchwarden that the girl was not liked in the valley he suspected curtly attributing her unpopularity to the women's senseless jealousy of gossip concerning her he had heard no further hint but instinctively and partly from that rugged natural reserve of his shrank from mentioning her name even incidentally to his mother now on sunday evenings he often strolled up to the vicarage each time quitting his mother with the same awkward affectation of casualness and on his return becoming vaguely conscious of how she refrained from any comment on his absence and appeared oddly oblivious to the existence of parson blencarn's niece she had always been a sour-tongued woman but as the days shortened with the approach of the long winter months she seemed to him to grow more fretful than ever at times it was almost as if she bore him some smouldering sullen resentment he was of stubborn fibre however toughened by long habit of oblique unruly climate he revolved the matter in his mind deliberately and when at last after much plodding thought it dawned upon him that she resented his acquaintance with rosa blencarn he accepted the solution with an unflinching phlegm and merely shifted his attitude towards the girl calculating each day the likelihood of his meeting her and making in her presence persistent efforts to break down once for all the barrier of his own timidity he was a man not to be clumsily driven still less so he prided himself a man to be craftily led it was close upon christmas time before the crisis came his mother was just home from penrith market the spring cart stood in the yard the old grey horse was steaming heavily in the still frosty air i reckon you've come fast told horse is over hot he remarked bluntly as he went to the animal's head she clambered down hastily and coming to his side began breathlessly you ought to have come to market tony there's been pretty goings on in penrith to-day i was helping anna forsyth to choose six yards of sheeting in dockroy when we sees rosa blencarn come out to the bell and bullock in company with kirbison and young joe smethick smethick was fair reeling drunk and kirbison and t girl were a-holding on to him to keep him for falling and then after a bit he puts his arm round the girl to steady hisself and that fashion they goes off right up to public street he continued to unload the packages and to carry them mechanically one by one into the house each time when he reappeared she was standing by the steaming horse busy with her tail and on t road home we passed three of them in kirbison's trap with smethick leering in t bottom singing maudlin songs they were passing dunscale village and folks come running out to the houses to see em go past he led the cart away towards the stable leaving her to cry the remainder after him across the yard half an hour later he came in for his dinner during the meal not a word passed between them and directly he had finished he strode out of the house about nine o'clock he returned lit his pipe and sat down to smoke it 
over the kitchen fire. "'Where have you been, Tony?' she asked. "'Up to Vicarage, courting,' he retorted defiantly, with his pipe in his mouth. This was ten months ago. Ever since he had been doggedly waiting. That evening he had set his mind on the girl. He intended to have her, and while his mother jibed, as she did now upon every opportunity, his patience remained grimly unflagging. She would remind him that the farm belonged to her, that he would have to wait till her death before he could bring the hussy to Hootsey. He would retort that as soon as the girl would have him, he intended taking a small holding over at Scarsdale. Then she would give way, and for a while piteously upbraid him with her old age, and with the memory of all the years she and he had spent together, and he would comfort her with a display of brusque, evasive remorse. But, none the less, on the morrow, his thoughts would return to dwell on the haunting vision of the girl's face, while in his rude, credulous chivalry, kindled by the recollection of her beauty, stifled his misgivings concerning her conduct. Meanwhile she dallied with him, and amused herself with the younger men. Her old uncle fell ill in the spring, and could scarcely leave the house. She declared that she found life in the valley intolerably dull, that she hated the quiet of the place, that she longed for leads, and the exciting bustle of the streets, and in the evenings she wrote long letters to the girlfriend she had left behind there, describing with petulant vivacity her tribe of rustic admirers. At the harvest time she went back on a fortnight's visit to friends. The evening before her departure she promised Antony to give him her answer on her return. But instead she avoided him, pretended to have promised in jest, and took up with Luke Stock, a cattle dealer from Wigton. End of Antony Garstin's Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe Part 4《Section Five of Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe et al. Anthony Garstin's Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe. Savoy, July, 1896. Section 5. It was three weeks since he had fetched his flock down from the fell. After dinner, he and his mother sat together in the parlour. They had done so every Sunday afternoon, year in and year out, as far back as he could remember. A row of mahogany chairs with shiny horsehair seats were ranged round the room. A great collection of agricultural prize tickets were pinned over the wall and on a heavy, highly polished sideboard stood several silver cups. A heap of gilt-edged shavings filled the unused grate. There were gaudily tinted roses along the mantelpiece, and on a small table by the window, beneath a glass case, a gilt basket filled with imitation flowers. Every object was disposed with a scrupulous precision. The carpet and the red pattern cloth on the centre table were much faded. The room was spotlessly clean, and wore, in the chilly winter sunlight, a rigid, comfortless air. Neither spoke, or appeared conscious of the other's presence. Old Mrs. Garstin, wrapped in a woollen shawl, sat knitting. Antony dozed fitfully, on a stiff-backed chair. Of a sudden, in the distance, a bell started tolling. Antony rubbed his eyes drowsily, and taking from the table his Sunday hat, strolled out across the dusky fields presently reaching a rude wooden seat built beside the bridle path he sat down and relit his pipe the air was very still below him a white filmy mist hung across the valley the fell sides vaguely grouped resembled hulking masses of sombre shadow and as he looked back three squares of glimmering gold revealed the lighted windows of the square towered church he sat smoking pondering, with placid and reverential contemplation on the mighty maker of the world, a world majestically and inevitably ordered, a world where, he argued, each object, each fissure in the fells, the winding course of each tumbling stream, possesses its mysterious purport, 
its inevitable signification at the end of the field two rams were fighting retreating then running together and leaping from the ground butting head to head and horn to horn antony watched them absently pursuing his rude meditations and the succession of bad seasons the slow ruination of the farmers throughout the country were but punishment meted out for the accumulated wickedness of the world in the olden time god rained plagues upon the land nowadays in his wrath he spoiled the produce of the earth which with his own hands he had fashioned and bestowed upon men he rose and continued his walk along the bridle path a multitude of rabbits scuttled up the hill at his approach and a great cloud of plovers rising from the rushes circled overhead filling the air with a profusion of their querulous cries all at once he heard a rattling of stones and perceived a number of small pieces of shingle bounding in front of him down the grassy slope a woman's figure was moving among the rocks above him the next moment by the trimming of crimson velvet on her hat he had recognized her he mounted the slope with springing strides wondering the while how it was she came to be there that she was not in church playing the organ at afternoon service before she was aware of his approach he was beside her i thought you'd be in church he began she started then gradually regaining her composure answered weakly smiling mr jenkinson the new schoolmaster wanted to try the organ he came towards her impulsively she saw the odd flickers in his eyes as she stepped back in dismay nay but i will not harm you he said only i reckon what tis a special turn of providence meeting with you up here i reckon what you'll have to give me a square answer no you canna dilly dally everlastingly he spoke almost brutally and she stood white and gasping staring at him with large frightened eyes the sheep walk was but a tiny thread-like track the slope of the shingle on either side was very steep below them lay the valley distant lifeless all blurred by the evening dusk she looked about her helplessly for a means of escape miss rosa he continued in a husky voice can ye na come to think o me think ye i've been waiting nigh upon two year for ye i've watched ye take up first with this young feller and then with that till sometimes my heart's fit to burst many a day up unto felltop to thought ye is nice driven me daft and I've left my shepherdin just to set on cairn, int mist, picturin' and broodin' on your face. Many an evening I started up to vicarage with resolution to speak right out to you. But when it come to point, a sort of timidity seemed to hold me back. I was that fear to displease you. I know I'm no scholar, and maybe you think I'm rough-mannered. I know I've spoken sharply to you once or twice lately, but it's just because I'm that mad with love for you. I just canna help myself sometimes. He waited, peering into her face. She could see the beads of sweat above his bristling eyebrows. The damp had settled on his sandy beard. His horny fingers were twitching at the buttons of his black Sunday coat. She struggled to summon a smile, but her underlip quivered, and her large dyke eyes filled slowly with tears. And he went on, You come to mean just everything to me. If you'll na have me, I care for naught else. I canna speak to you in phrases. I'm just a plain, unscholarly man. I canna wheedle you with cunning and to fashion o' a tomb folks, but I can love you at all my might and watch over you and work for you better than any one of em. She was crying to herself silently while he spoke. He noticed nothing, however. The twilight hid her face from him. There's naught against me, he persisted. I'm as good a man as any one of em. Ay, as good a man as any one o' em, he repeated defiantly, raising his voice. It's impossible, Mr. Garston, it's impossible. You've been very kind to me, she added in a choking voice. Why, well, dang it, I didn't a mean to make you cry, lass, he exclaimed with a softening of his tone. There's naught for you to cry over. She sank on to the stones, passionately sobbing in hysterical and defenceless despair antony stood a moment gazing at her in clumsy perplexity then coming close to her put his hand on her shoulder and said gently come lass what's trouble you can trust me she shook her head faintly 
"'Ay, but you can, though,' he asserted firmly. "'Come, what is't?' Heedless of him, she continued to rock herself to and fro, crooning in her distress. "'Oh, I wish I were dead! I wish I could die!' "'Wish you could die?' he repeated. "'Why, whatever can be that's troubling you like this? "'There, there, lassie, give over. It'll all come right, whatever it be.' "'No, no,' she wailed. "'I wish I could die! I wish I could die!' lights were twinkling in the village below and across the valley darkness was draping the hills the girl lifted her face from her hands and looked up at him with a scared bewildered expression i must go home i must be getting home she muttered nay but there's something mighty amiss wi you no tis nothing no it's nothing i don't know i'm not well i mean it's nothing it'll pass over you mustn't think anything of it nay but i canna stand by and see you in such trouble it's nothing mr garston indeed it's nothing she repeated ay but i canna credit that he objected stubbornly she sent him a shifting hunted glance let me get home you must let me get home she made a tremulous pitiful attempt at firmness eyeing her keenly he barred her path she flushed scarlet and looked hastily away across the valley if you tell me your distress maybe i can help you no no it's nothing it's nothing if you tell me your distress maybe i can help you he repeated with a solemn deliberate sternness she shivered and looked away again vaguely across the valley you can do nothing there's naught to be done she murmured drearily there's a man in this business he declared let me go let me go she pleaded desperately who is it that's been putting you into this distress his voice sounded loud and harsh no one no one i canna tell you mr garston it's no one she protested weakly the white twisted look on his face frightened her my god he burst out gripping her wrist and a proper soft fool you made o' me who is it i tell you who's the man you're hurting me i canna tell you and you're fond o him oh no he's a wicked sinful man i pray god i may never set eyes on him again i told him so but if he's a got you into trouble he'll have to marry you he persisted with a brutal bitterness i will not i hate him she cried fiercely but is he willing to marry you i don't know i don't care he said so before he went away but i'll kill myself sooner than live with him he let her hands fall and stepped back from her she could only see his figure like a sombre cloud standing before her the whole fell side seemed still and dark and lonely presently she heard his voice again i reckon what there's one road o'er to your distress she shook her head drearily there's none i'm a lost woman and if you took me instead he said eagerly i, I don't understand if you married me instead of luke stock but that's impossible the the ay it's a child i know but i'll take the child as mine she remained silent after a moment he heard her voice answer in a queer distant tone you mean that that you're ready to marry me and adopt the child i do he answered doggedly but people your mother folks'll just know naught about it it's none of their business child will pass as mine you'll accept that yes she answered in a low rapid voice you consent to have me if i get you out of your trouble yes she repeated in the same tone she heard him draw a long breath i said twas a turn of providence meeting where you appear he exclaimed with a half suppressed exultation her teeth began to chatter a little she felt that he was peering at her curiously through the darkness and no he continued brusquely you best be getting home give me your hand and i'll steady you o'er the stones he helped her down the bank of shingle exclaiming by gum you're stony cold once or twice she slipped he supported her roughly gripping her knuckles the stones rolled down the steps noisily disappearing into the night presently they struck the turf bridle path and as they descended silently towards the lights of the village he said gravely i always reckoned what my dead come she made no reply and he added grimly there'll be terrible work with mother over this 
he accompanied her down the narrow lane that led past her uncle's house when the lighted windows came in sight he halted good night lassie he said kindly do you give over distressing yourself good night mr garstin she answered in the same low rapid voice in which she had given her answer up on the fell we're man and plighted wife now are we not he blurted timidly she held her face to his and he kissed her on the cheek clumsily section six the next morning the frost had set in the sky was still clear and glittering the whitened fields sparkled in the chilly sunlight here and there on high distant peaks gleamed dainty caps of snow all the week antony was to be busy at the fell foot wall building against the coming of the winter storms the work was heavy for he was single-handed and the stone had to be fetched from the fell side two or three times a day he led his rickety lumbering cart along the lane that passed the vicarage gate pausing on each journey to glance furtively up at the windows but he saw no sign of rosa blencarn and indeed he felt no longing to see her he was grimly exultant over the remembrance of his wooing of her and over the knowledge that she was his there glowed within him a stolid pride in himself he thought of the others who had courted her and the means by which he had won her seemed to him a fine stroke of cleverness and so he refrained from any mention of the matter relishing as he worked all alone the days through the consciousness of his secret triumph and anticipating with inward chucklings the discomforted cackle of his mother's female friends he foresaw without misgiving her bitter opposition he felt himself strong and his heart warmed towards the girl and when at intervals the brusque realization that after all he was to possess her swept over him he gripped the stones and swung them almost fiercely into their places all around him the white empty fields seemed slumbering breathlessly the stillness stiffened the leafless trees the frosty air flicked his blood singing vigorously to himself he worked with a stubborn unflagging resolution methodically postponing till the length of the war should be completed the announcement of his betrothal after his reticent solitary fashion he was very happy reviewing his future prospects with a plain and steady assurance and as the weekend approached coming to ignore the irregularity of the whole business almost to assume in the exultation of his pride that he had won her honestly and to discard stolidly all thought of luke's stock of his relations with her of the coming child that was to pass for his own and there were moments too when as he sauntered homewards through the dusk at the end of his day's work his heart grew full to overflowing of a rugged superstitious gratitude towards god in heaven who had granted his desires about three o'clock on the saturday afternoon he finished the length of war he went home washed shaved put on his sunday coat and avoiding the kitchen where his mother sat knitting by the fireside strode up to the vicarage it was rosa who opened the door to him on recognizing him she started and he followed her into the dining-room he seated himself and began brusquely i've come miss rosa to speak to mr blencarn then added eyeing her closely you're looking sick lass her faint smile accentuated the worn white look on her face i reckon you've been fretting yourself he continued gently lean awake a night some you know she smiled vaguely well but you seen i've come to set the whole business for you you thought maybe i wasn't a man o my word no no not that she protested but 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 what then you must not do it mr garstin i must just bear my own trouble the best i can she broke out do you fancy i'm taking you out of charity you little reckon the sort of stuff my love for you's made of nay miss rosa but you canna draw back no but you cannot do it mr garstin i know your mother will na have me at hootsey i couldn't live there with your mother i sooner bear my trouble alone as best i can she's that stern is mrs garstin i couldn't look her in the face i can go away somewhere i could keep it all from uncle her colour came and went she stood before him looking away from him dully out of the window i intend you to come to hootsey i'm the lad i reckon i can choose my own wife mother'll have you to farm right enough you need na distress yourself on that point 
nay mr garstin but indeed she will not never i know she will not she always set herself against me right from the first ay but that was different the case is all changed no he objected doggedly she'll support the sight o me all the less the girl faltered mother'll have ye at hootsy receive ye willing her o her own free wish ye hear i'll answer for that he struck the table with his fist heavily his tone of determination awed her she glanced at him hurriedly struggling with her irresolution i know how to manage mother and now he concluded changing his tone is your uncle about to place he's up the paddock i think she answered well i just step up and have a word with him yet yeah, you will not tell him tut tut narrow in tout no harrowing tales you need na fear lass i reckon if i can tackle mother i can accommodate myself to parson blencarn he rose and coming close to her scanned her face you must get to roses back in your cheeks he exclaimed with a short laugh i canna be taking a ghost to church she smiled tremulously and he continued laying one hand affectionately on her shoulder nay but i was just jesting roses or no roses ye be to bonnie's brise in all cumberland i'll meet you in hullam lane after church time to-morrow he added moving towards the door after he had gone she hurried to the back door furtively his retreating figure was already mounting the grey upland field presently beyond him she perceived her uncle emerging through the paddock gate she ran across the poultry yard she ran across the poultry yard and mounting a tub stood watching the two figures as they moved towards one another along the brow antony vigorously trudging with his hands thrust deep in his pockets her uncle his wide awake tilted over nose hobbling and leaning stiffly on his pair of sticks they met she saw antony take her uncle's arm the two turning together strolled away towards the fell she went back into the house antony's dog came towards her slinking along the passage she caught the animal's head in her hands and bent over it caressingly in an impulsive outburst of almost hysterical affection section seven the two men returned towards the vicarage at the paddock gate they halted and the old man concluded i could not have wished a better man for her antony maybe the lord'll not be minded to spare me much longer after i'm gone rose'll have all i possess she was my poor brother isaac's only child after her mother was taken he poor fellow went altogether to the bad and until she came here she mostly lived among strangers it's been a wretched sort of childhood for her a wretched sort of childhood you'll take care of her antony will you not nay but i could not have wished a better man for her and there's my hand on it thank ye mr blencarn thank ye antony answered huskily gripping the old man's hand and he started off down the lane homewards his heart was full of a strange rugged exultation he felt with a swelling pride that god had entrusted to him this great charge to tend her to make up to her tenfold for all that loving care which in her childhood she had never known and together with a stubborn confidence in himself there welled up within him a great pity for her a tender pity that chastening with his passion made her seem to him as he brooded over that lonely childhood of hers the more distinctly beautiful the more profoundly precious he pictured to himself tremulously almost incredulously their married life in the winter his return home at nightfall to find her awaiting him with a glad trustful smile their evenings passed together sitting in silent happiness over the smouldering logs or in summer time the midday rest in the hayfields when wearing perhaps a large brimmed hat fastened with a red ribbon beneath her chin he would catch sight of her carrying his dinner coming across the upland she had not been brought up to be a farmer's wife she was but a child still as the old parson had said she should not have to work as other men's wives work she should dress like a lady and on sundays in church wear fine bonnets and remain as she always had been the belle of the parish and meanwhile he would farm as he had never farmed before watching his opportunities driving cunning bargains spending nothing on himself hoarding every penny that she might have what she wanted and as he strode through the village he seemed to foresee a general brightening of prospects 
a sobering of the fever of speculation in sheep a cessation of the insensate glutting year after year of the great winter marts throughout the north a slackening of the foreign competition followed by a steady revival of the price of fatted stocks a period of prosperity in store for the farmer at last and the future years appeared to open out before him spread like a distant glittering plain across which he and she hand in hand were called to travel together and then suddenly as his iron-bound boots clattered over the cobbled yard he remembered with brutal determination his mother and the stormy struggle that awaited him he waited till supper was over till his mother had moved from the table to her place by the chimney corner for several minutes he remained debating with himself the best method of breaking the news to her of a sudden he glanced up at her her knitting had slipped on to her lap she was sitting bunched of a heap in her chair nodding with sleep by the flickering light of the wood fire she looked worn and broken he felt a twinge of clumsy compunction and then he remembered the piteous hunted look in the girl's eyes and the old man's words when they had parted at the paddock gate and he blurted out i do but what i'll have to marry rosa blencarn after all she started and blinking her eyes said i was just taking a wink of sleep what was it you were saying tony he hesitated a moment puckering his forehead into coarse rugged lines and fidgeting noisily with his teacup presently he repeated i do but i'll have to marry rosa blencarn after all she rose stiffly and stepping down from the hearth came towards him maybe i didn't hear you right tony she spoke hurriedly and though she was quite close to him steadying herself with one hand clutching the back of his chair her voice sounded weak distant almost look up at me look up at my face she commanded fiercely he obeyed sullenly no with it what's your meaning tony i mean what i say he retorted doggedly averting his gaze what do you mean by saying that you've got to marry her i tell you i mean what i say he repeated dully you mean you've been and put the girl in trouble he said nothing but sat staring stupidly at the floor look up at me and answer she commanded gripping his shoulder and shaking him he raised his face slowly and met her glance ay that's about it he answered this'll na be truth it'll just be a piece o wanton trickery she cried nay but it's a truth he answered deliberately you will na swear to it she persisted i see na necessity for swearing then you canna swear to it she burst out triumphantly he paused an instant and then said quietly ay but i'll swear to it easy enough fetch the book she lifted the heavy tattered bible from the chimney-piece and placed it before him on the table he laid his lumpish fist on it say she continued with a tense tremulousness say i swear to you mother that tis the truth told truth and no but the truth s'elp me god i swear to you mother tis the truth told truth and nothing but the truth s'elp me god he repeated after her kiss the book she ordered he lifted the bible to his lips as he replaced it on the table he burst into a short laugh be you satisfied no she went back to the chimney without a word the logs on the hearth hissed and crackled outside amidst the blackness the wind was rising hooting through the firs and past the windows after a long while he roused himself and drawing his pipe from his pocket almost steadily proceeded leisurely to pare in the palm of his hand a lump of black tobacco we'll be asked in church sunday he remarked bluntly she made no answer he looked across at her her mouth was drawn tight at the corners her face wore a queer rigid aspect she looked he thought like a figure of stone you're not feeling poorly are you mother he asked she shook her head grimly then hobbling out into the room began to speak in a shrill tuneless voice you talked at one time o' taking a farm over in Scardell's way, but you best stop here. I'll no hinder you. You can have the large bedroom in front, and I'll move over to what used to be my brother Jake's room. You know I've never had an opinion of the girl, but I'll do what's right by her if if I break my spirit on the doing of it. 
I made the girl welcome here, I'll stand by a proper life. Maybe I'll finish by finding some good in her. But from this day forward, Tony, you're no son of mine. You dishonoured yourself. You laid a trap for me, and laid a trap, that's the word. You brought shame and bitterness unto your old mother in her old age. You made me despise to very set to you. You can stop on here, but you shall never touch a penny of my money. Every shilling of it shall go to your child, or to your child's children. Aye she went on raising her voice ay you've got your way at last and maybe you reckon you've chosen a mighty smart way but time will come when you'll regret this day when you'll eat you to your repentance and do to an ashes ay lord will punish you tony chastise you properly you learn that marriage begun in sin can end in naught but sin ay she concluded as she reached the door raising her skinny hand prophetically ay and after i'm dead and gone ye mind it the words of the apostle for them that have sinned without law shall also perish without law and she slammed the door behind her end of anthony garstin's courtship by hubert crackenthorpe section six of victorian short stories tales of courtship this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe et al. A Little Grey Glove by George Egerton. Keynotes, London. Elkin Matthews and John Lane, Vigo Street. 1893 early spring 1893 the book of life begins with a man and woman in a garden and ends with revelations oscar wilde yes most fellows book of life may be said to begin at the chapter where woman comes in mine did she came in years ago when i was a raw undergraduate with the sober thought of retrospective analysis i may say she was not all my fancy painted her indeed now that i come to think of it there was no fancy about the vermeil of her cheeks rather an artificial reality she had her bower in the bar of the golden boar and i was madly in love with her seriously intent on lawful wedlock luckily for me she threw me over for a neighbouring pork butcher but at the time i took it hardly and it made me sex shy i was a very poor man in those days one feels one's griefs more keenly then one hasn't the wherewithal to buy distraction besides ladies snubbed me rather on the rare occasions i met them later i fell in for a legacy the forerunner of several indeed i may say i am beastly rich my tastes are simple too and i haven't any poor relations I believe they are of great assistance in getting rid of superfluous capital. Wish I had some. It was after the legacy that women discovered my attractions. They found that there was something superb in my plainness, before they said ugliness. Something after the style of the late Victor Emmanuel, something infinitely more striking than mere ordinary beauty. At least so Harding told me his sister said, and she had the reputation of being a clever girl being an only child i never had the opportunity other fellows had of studying the undressed side of women through familiar intercourse say with sisters their most ordinary belongings were sacred to me i had i used to be told ridiculous high-flown notions about them by the way i modified those considerably on closer acquaintance I ought to study them, nothing like a woman for developing a fellow. So I laid in a stock of books in different languages, mostly novels, in which women played title roles, in order to get up some definite data before venturing amongst them. I can't say I derived much benefit from this course. There seemed to be as great a diversity of opinion about the female species as, let us say, about the Seminidae. My friend Parson B. Smith, who is one of the oldest fly-fishers in the three kingdoms, said to me once, Take my word for it, there are only four true salmon, the salar, the truta, the fario, the ferox, all the rest are just varieties, subgenuses of the above. Stick to that. 
some writing fellow divided all the women into good uns and bad uns but as a conscientious stickler for truth i must say that both in trout as in women i have found myself faced with the most puzzling varieties that were a tantalizing blending of several qualities i then resolved to study them on my own account i pursued the eternal feminine in a spirit of purely scientific investigation i knew you'd laugh sceptically at that but it's a fact i was impartial in my selection of subjects for observation french german spanish as well as the home product nothing in petticoats escaped me i devoted myself to the freshest ingenue as well as the experienced widow of three departed and i may as well confess that the more i saw of her the less i understood her but i think they understood me they refused to take me au sérieux when they weren't fleecing me they were interested in the state of my soul i preferred the former but all humbugged me equally so i gave them up i took to rod and gun instead pro salute animae it's decidedly safer i have scoured every country in the globe indeed i can say that i have shot and fished in woods and waters where no other white man perhaps ever dropped a beast or played a fish before there is no life like the life of a free wanderer and no law like the law one gleans in the great book of nature but one must have freed one's spirit from the taint of the town before one can even read the alphabet of its mystic meaning what has this to do with the glove true not much and yet it has a connection it accounts for me well for twelve years i have followed the impulses of the wandering spirit that dwells in me i have seen the sun rise in finland and gild the devil's knuckles as he sank behind the drakensberg i have caught the barber and the gamer yellowfish in the Vaal river taken muskelunga and black bass in canada thrown a fly over guapote and cavallo in central american lakes and choked the monster eels of the mauritius with a cunningly faked up duckling but i have been shy as a chub at the shadow of a woman well it happened last year i came back on business another confounded legacy end of june too just as i was off to finland but messrs thimble and rig the highly respectable firm who look after my affairs represented that i owed it to others whom i kept out of their share of the legacy to stay near town till affairs were wound up they told me with a view to reconcile me perhaps of a trout stream with a decent inn near it an unknown stream in kent it seems a junior member of the firm is an angler at least he sometimes catches pike or perch in the medways some way from the stream where the trout rise in audacious security from artificial lures i stipulated for a clerk to come down with any papers to be signed and started at once for victoria i declined to tell the name of my find firstly because the trout are the gamest little fish that ever rose to fly and run to a good two pounds secondly i have paid for all the rooms in the inn for the next year and i want it to myself the glove is lying on the table next me as i write if it isn't in my breast pocket or under my pillow it is in some place where i can see it it has a delicate grey body suede i think they call it with a whipping of silver round the top and a darker grey silk tag to fasten it it is marked five and three quarters inside and has a delicious scent about it to keep off moths i suppose naphthalene is better it reminds me of a silver sedge tied on a ten hook i startled the good landlady of the little inn there is no village fortunately when i arrived with the only porter of the tiny station laden with traps she hesitated about a private sitting-room but eventually we compromised matters as i was willing to share it with the other visitor i got into knickerbockers at once collared a boy to get me worms and minnow for the morrow and as i felt too lazy to unpack tackle just sat in the shiny armchair made comfortable by the successive sitting of former occupants at the open window and looked out the river not the trout stream winds to the right 
and the trees cast trembling shadows into its clear depths the red tiles of a farm roof show between the beeches and break the monotony of blue sky background a dusty wagoner is slaking his thirst with a tankard of ale i am conscious of the strange lonely feeling that a visit to england always gives me away in strange lands even in solitary places one doesn't feel it somehow one is filled with the hunter's lust bent on a kill but at home in the quiet country with the smoke curling up from some fireside the mowers busy laying the hay in swathes the children tumbling under the trees in the orchards and a girl singing as she spreads the clothes on the sweetbriar hedge amidst a scene quick with home sights and sounds a strange lack creeps in and makes itself felt in a dull aching way oddly enough too i had a sense of uneasiness as something going to happen i had often experienced it when out alone in a great forest or on an unknown lake but it always meant where danger of some kind but why should i feel it here yet i did and i couldn't shake it off i took to examining the room it was a commonplace one of the usual type but there was a work-basket on the table a dainty thing lined with blue satin there was a bit of lace stretched over the shiny blue linen with the needle sticking in it such fairy work like cobwebs seen from below spun from a branch against a background of sky a gold thimble too with initials not the landlady's i know but what pretty things too in the basket a scissors capital shape for fly-making a little file and some floss silk and tinsel the identical colour i want for a new fly i have in my head one that will be a demon to kill the northern devil i mean to call him some one looks in behind me and a light step passes upstairs i drop the basket i don't know why there are some reviews near it i take up one and am soon buried in an article on tasmanian fauna it is strange but whenever i do know anything about a subject i always find these writing fellows either entirely ignorant or damned wrong after supper i took a stroll to see the river it was a silver-grey evening with just the last lemon and pink streaks of the sunset staining the sky there had been a shower and somehow the smell of the dust after rain mingled with the mignonette in the garden brought back vanished scenes of small boyhood when i caught minnows in a bottle and dreamt of a shilling rod as happiness unattainable i turned aside from the road in accordance with directions and walked towards the stream hello someone before me what a bore the angler is hidden by an elder bush but i can see the fly drop delicately artistically into the water fishing upstream too there is a bit of broken water there and the midges dance in myriads a silver gleam and the line spins out and the fly falls just in the right place it is growing dusk but the fellow is an adept at quick fine casting i wonder what fly he has on why he's going to try downstream now i hurry forward and as i near him i swerve to the left out of the way <sniffs> a sudden sting in the lobe of my ear hey i cry as i find i am caught the tail fly is fast in it a slight grey-clad woman holding the rod lays it carefully down and comes towards me through the gathering dusk my first impulse is to snap the gut and take to my heels but i am held by something less tangible but far more powerful than the grip of the limerick hook in my ear i am very sorry she says in a voice that matched the evening it was so quiet and soft but it was exceedingly stupid of you to come behind like that i didn't think you threw such a long line i thought i was safe i stammered hold this she says giving me a diminutive fly-book out of which she has taken a scissors i obey meekly she snips the gut have you a sharp knife if i strip the hook you can push it through it is lucky it isn't in the cartilage i suppose i am an awful idiot but i only handed her the knife and she proceeded as calmly as if stripping a hook in a man's ear were an everyday occurrence her gown is of some soft grey stuff and her grey leather belt is silver clasped 
her hands are soft and cool and steady but there is a rarely disturbing thrill in their gentle touch the thought flashed through my mind that i had just missed that a woman's voluntary tender touch not a paid caress all my life now you can push it through yourself i hope it won't hurt much taking the hook i push it through and a drop of blood follows it oh she cries but i assure her it is nothing and stick the hook surreptitiously in my coat sleeve then we both laugh and i look at her for the first time she has a very white forehead with little tendrils of hair blowing round it under her grey cap her eyes are grey i didn't see that then i only saw that they were steady smiling eyes that matched her mouth such a mouth the most maddening mouth a man ever longed to kiss above a two-pointed chin soft as a child's indeed the whole face looks soft in the misty light i am sorry if i spoilt your sport i say oh that don't matter it's time to stop i got two brace one a beauty she is winding in her line and i look in her basket they are beauties one two pounder the rest running from half to a pound what fly yellow dun took that one but your assailant was a partridge spider i sling her basket over my shoulder she takes it as a matter of course and we retrace our steps i feel curiously happy as we walk towards the road there is a novel delight in her nearness the feel of woman works subtly and strangely in me the rustle of her skirt as it brushes the black head in the meadow grass and the delicate perfume partly violets partly herself that comes to me with each of her movements is a rare pleasure i am hardly surprised when she turns into the garden of the inn i think i knew from the first that she would better bathe that ear of yours and put a few drops of carbolic in the water she takes the basket as she says it and goes into the kitchen i hurry over this and go into the little sitting-room there is a tray with a glass of milk and some oaten cakes and some oaten cakes upon the table i am too disturbed to sit down i stand at the window and watch the bats flitter in the gathering moonlight and listen with quivering nerves for her step perhaps she will send for the tray and not come after all what a fool i am to be disturbed by a grey-clad witch with a tantalising mouth that comes of loafing about doing nothing i mentally darn the old fool who saved her money instead of spending it why the devil should i be bothered i don't want it anyhow she comes in as i fume and i forget everything at her entrance i push the armchair towards the table and she sinks quietly into it pulling the tray nearer she has a wedding ring on but somehow it never strikes me to wonder if she is married or a widow or who she may be i am content to watch her break her biscuits she has the prettiest hands and a trick of separating her last fingers when she takes hold of anything they remind me of white orchids i saw somewhere she led me to talk about africa i think i liked to watch her eyes glow deeply in the shadow and then catch light as she bent forward to say something in her quick responsive way long ago when i was a girl she said once long ago i echo incredulously surely not ah but yes you haven't seen me in the daylight with a soft little laugh do you know what the gypsies say never judge a woman or a ribbon by candlelight they might have said moonlight equally well she rises as she speaks and i feel an overpowering wish to have her put out her hand but she does not she only takes the work-basket and a book and says good-night with an inclination of her little head i go over and stand next to her chair i don't like to sit in it but i like to put my hand where her head leant and fancy if she were there how she would look up i woke next morning with a curious sense of pleasurable excitement i whistled from very lightness of heart as i dressed when i got down i found the landlady clearing away her breakfast things i felt disappointed and resolved to be down earlier in future i didn't feel inclined to try the minnow i put them in a tub in the yard and tried to read and listen for her step i dined alone the day dragged terribly i did not like to ask about her 
I had a notion she might not like it. I spent the evening on the river. I might have filled a good basket, but I let the beggars rest. After all, I had caught fish enough to stock all the rivers in Great Britain. There are other things than trout in the world. I sit and smoke a pipe where she caught me last night. If I half close my eyes, I can see hers and her mouth in the smoke. That is one of the curious charms of Baccy. It helps to reproduce brain pictures. After a bit, I think, perhaps she has left. I get quite feverish at the thought and hasten back. I must ask. I look up at the window as I pass. There is surely a gleam of white. I throw down my traps and hasten up. She is leaning with her arms on the window ledge, staring out into the gloom. I could swear I caught a suppressed sob as I entered. I cough, and she turns quickly and bows slightly. A bonnet and glove and lace affair, and a lot of papers are lying on the table. I am awfully afraid she is going. I say, Please don't let me drive you away. It is so early yet. I half expected to see you on the river. Nothing so pleasant. I have been up in town. The tears have certainly got into her voice. All day. It was so hot and dusty. I am tired out. The little servant brings in the lamp and a tray with a bottle of lemonade. Mistress hasn't any lemons, m'm. Will this do? Yes, she says wearily. She is shading her eyes with her hand. Anything. I am fearfully thirsty. Let me concoct you a drink instead. I have lemons and ice and things. My man sent me down supplies today. I leave him in town. I am rather a dab at drinks. I learned it from the Yankees. About the only thing I did learn from them I care to remember. Susan? The little maid helps me to get the materials, and she watches me quietly. When I give it to her, she takes it with a smile. She has been crying. That is an ample thank you. She looks quite old. Something more than tiredness called up those lines in her face. Well, ten days passed. Sometimes we met at breakfast, sometimes at supper, sometimes we fished together, or sat in the straggling orchard and talked. She neither avoided me nor sought me. She is the most charming mixture of child and woman I ever met. She is a dual creature. Now I never met that in a man. When she is here without getting a letter in the morning or going to town, she seems like a girl. She runs about in her grey gown and little cap and laughs, and seems to throw off all thought like an irresponsible child. She is eager to fish or pick gooseberries and eat them daintily, or sit under the trees and talk. But when she goes to town, I notice she always goes when she gets a lawyer's letter. There is no mistaking the envelope. She comes home tired and haggard-looking, an old woman of thirty-five. I wonder why. It takes her, even with her elasticity of temperament, nearly a day to get young again. I hate her to go to town. It is extraordinary how I miss her. I can't recall when she is absent her saying anything very wonderful, but she converses all the time. She has a gracious way of filling the place with herself. There is an entertaining quality in her very presence. We had one rainy afternoon. She tied me some flies. I shan't use any of them. I watched the lights in her hair as she moved. It is quite golden in some places, and she has a tiny mole near her left ear, and another on her left wrist. On the eleventh day she got a letter, but she didn't go to town. She stayed up in her room all day. Twenty times I felt inclined to send her a line, but I had no excuse. I heard the landlady say as I passed the kitchen window, Poor dear, I'm sorry to lose her. Lose her? I should think not. It has come to this with me, that I don't care to face any future without her. And yet I know nothing about her, not even if she is a free woman. I shall find that out next time I see her. In the evening I catch a glimpse of her gown in the orchard, and I follow her. We sit down near the river. Her left hand is lying gloveless, next to me in the grass. Do you think, from what you have seen of me, that I would ask a question out of any mere impertinent curiosity? She starts. No, I do not. I take up her hand and touch the ring. Tell me, does this bind you to anyone? 
I am conscious of a buzzing in my ears, and a dancing blur of water and sky and trees as I wait, it seems to me, for an hour, for her reply. I felt the same sensation once before, when I got drawn into some rapids and had an awfully narrow shave, but of that another time. The voice is shaking. I am not legally bound to anyone, at least. But why do you ask? She looks me square in the face as she speaks, with a touch of haughtiness I never saw in her before. Perhaps the great relief I feel, the sense of joy at knowing she is free, speaks out of my face, for hers flushes and she drops her eyes, her lips tremble. I don't look at her again, but I can see her all the same. After a while, she says, I half intended to tell you something about myself this evening. Now I must. Let us go in. I shall come down to the sitting-room after your supper. She takes a long look at the river and the inn, as if fixing the place in her memory. It strikes me with a chill that there is a good-bye in her gaze. Her eyes rest on me a moment as they come back. There is a sad look in their grey clearness. She swings her little grey gloves in her hand as we walk back. I can hear her walking up and down overhead. How tired she will be, and how slowly the time goes. I am standing at one side of the window when she enters. She stands at the other, leaning her head against the shutter with her hands clasped before her. I can hear my own heart beating, and, I fancy, hers through the stillness. The suspense is fearful. At length, she says, "'You have been a long time out of England.' You don't read the papers? No. A pause. I believe my heart is beating inside my head. You ask me if I was a free woman. I don't pretend to misunderstand why you ask me. I am not a beautiful woman. I never was. For there must be something about me. There is in some women, essential femininity perhaps, that appeals to all men. What I read in your eyes I have seen in many men's before, but before God I never tried to rouse it. Today, with a sob, I can say I am free. Yesterday morning, I could not. Yesterday my husband gained his case and divorced me. She closes her eyes and draws in her underlip to stop its quivering. I want to take her in my arms, but I am afraid to. I did not ask you any more than if you were free. No, but I am afraid you don't quite take in the meaning. I did not divorce my husband. He divorced me. He got a decree nisi. Do you understand now? She is speaking with difficulty. Do you know what that implies? I can't stand her face any longer. I take her hands. They are icy cold and hold them tightly. Yes, I know what it implies. That is, I know the legal and social conclusion to be drawn from it, if that is what you mean. "'But I never asked you for that information. "'I have nothing to do with your past. "'You did not exist for me before the day we met on the river. "'I take you from that day, and I ask you to marry me.' "'I feel her tremble, and her hands get suddenly warm. "'She turns her head and looks at me long and searchingly. "'Then she says, "'Sit down. I want to say something.' "'I obey, and she comes and stands next the chair.' I can't help it. I reach up my arm, but she puts it gently down. No, you must listen without touching me. I shall go back to the window. I don't want to influence you a bit by any personal magnetism I possess. I want you to listen. I have told you he divorced me. The co-respondent was an old friend, a friend of my childhood, of my girlhood. He died just after the first application was made, luckily for me. He would have considered my honour before my happiness. I did not defend the case. It wasn't likely. Ah, if you knew all! He proved his case, given clever counsel, willing witnesses to whom you can make it worth while, and no defence. Divorce is always attainable, even in England. But remember, I figure as an adulteress in every English-speaking paper. If you buy last week's evening papers, do you remember the day I was in town? I nod. You will see a sketch of me in that day's. Someone, perhaps he, must have given it. It was from an old photograph. I bought one at Victoria as I came out. It is funny, 
with a hysterical laugh, to buy a caricature of one's own poor face at a news stall. Yet in spite of that, I have felt glad. The point for you is that I have made no defence to the world, and, with a lifting of her head, I will make no apology, no explanation, no denial to you, now nor ever. I am very desolate, and your attention came very warm to me, but I don't love you. Perhaps I could learn to, with a rush of colour, for what you have said to-night, and it is because of that I tell you to weigh what this means. Later, when your care for me will grow into habit, you may chafe at my past. It is from that I would save you. I hold out my hands, and she comes and puts them aside, and takes me by the beard, and turns up my face and scans it earnestly. She must have been deceived a good deal. I let her do as she pleases. It is the wisest way with women, and it is good to have her touch me in that way. She seems satisfied. She stands leaning against the arm of the chair and says, I must learn first to think of myself as a free woman again. It almost seems wrong today to talk like this. Can you understand that feeling? I nod assent. Next time I must be sure, and you must be sure. She lays her fingers on my mouth as I am about to protest. Shh! You shall have a year to think. If you repeat then what you have said today, I shall give you your answer. You must not try to find me. I have money. If I am living, I will come here to you. If I am dead, you will be told of it. In the year between, I shall look upon myself as belonging to you, and render an account, if you wish, of every hour. You will not be influenced by me in any way, and you will be able to reason it out calmly. If you think better of it, don't come. I feel there would be no use trying to move her. I simply kiss her hands and say, As you will, dear woman, I shall be here. We don't say any more. She sits down on a footstool with her head against my knee, and I just smooth it. When the clocks strike ten through the house, she rises, and I stand up. I see that she has been crying quietly, poor, lonely little soul. I lift her off her feet and kiss her, and stammer out my sorrow at losing her, and she is gone. Next morning the little maid brought me an envelope from the lady, who left by the first train. It held a little grey glove. That is why I carry it always, and why I haunt the inn and never leave it for longer than a week. Why I sit and dream in the old chair that has a ghost of her presence always, dream of the spring to come with the mayfly on the wing, and the young summer when midges dance and the trout are growing fastidious, when she will come to me across the meadow grass, through the silver haze as she did before, come with her grey eyes shining to exchange herself for her little grey glove. End of A Little Grey Glove by George Egerton